that I am born for love. I am meant for love. It is my destiny to find love. And that's the part I want to articulate. And that's the part I want to then bring into relationship with that younger self and say, sweetheart, I'm so sorry you had that trauma. But let me tell you the deeper truth. You were not born to be alone. You came here to love and be loved. And you have the power to learn how to cultivate rich, loving relationships. It is your destiny to find great love in this lifetime. Two, one, zero, Hi, and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. This is your host, Orion. Thank you so much for being here. This is a very good interview. It's one of my favorite and I'm interviewing someone that without her knowing really influenced my life because I read her book before, just before I attracted my soulmate. And I think it had a lot to do with that book. That work that I did helped me call in my one. Catherine Woodward Thomas is a New York Times bestselling author of Conscious Uncoupling, Five Steps to Living Happily Ever After, and Calling in the One, Seven Weeks to Attracting the Love of Your Life, as well as an award-winning licensed marriage and family psychotherapist. Over the past two decades, Catherine has taught hundreds of thousands of people from all corners of the globe to create conscious loving relationships. Catherine's virtual learning communities include the Conscious Uncoupling and Calling in the One Quest with Mind Valley. She also trains and certifies Calling in the One coaches and Conscious Uncoupling coaches and provides ongoing supervision and development to a vibrant community of coaches from around the world. In this episode, you will learn what it takes to call in your true love, how to keep that true love, and how to consciously uncouple if you need to, unfortunately, in a less painful and more holistic way so you can create a brighter future for yourself and heal faster. I'm sure you're going to love this episode. It was just, I mean, she's so brilliant. It was amazing. You're going to enjoy every moment. And I feel like we all need to learn what she's got to teach because it's either we are in a relationship or getting out of a relationship or dealing with a relationship, our lives, it's all about relationships. And I think that the knowledge that she has, I feel, I know, and the exercises that she gives and the way she explains things are very important for everyone to learn. And now without further ado, on to the show. Hey, Catherine, and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. It's a joy to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be with you. Yes, I'm so grateful that you're here. Your book actually uh, really influenced my life, your first book, when I was looking for the love of my life. I'm grateful for you more than you know, you know. Before we begin, can you share your origin story and how did you started to change people's lives and help them with their life, love lives. That wasn't predictable early on that I would be able to do that because I was always a person. I had a lot of upheavals in my early life. Um, my mother was in and out of several marriages before I was an adult. And my father gave up parental rights when I was about 10 and married someone who did not in, want me in their home. And there was a lot of drama relationally. Wow. And consequently, that did play out in predictable patterns when I reached adulthood that were getting involved in impossible love situations, married men, alcoholic men, commitment phobic men, you know, all sorts of kind of toxic drama traumas in out push pull really that led to a chronically broken heart, truthfully, because I'd always been a person who wanted to find the right person and have a child of my own, having not 
had a happy childhood. I really wanted to create a happy family in my adulthood. So it, it felt pretty sad. You know, I'd always been a person who'd been working on myself, though. And I had been studying spiritual texts since I was a teenager. I did 12-step programs all through my 20s. I did many years of psychotherapy. So I got to a point where I kind of understood my issues. Like, I actually knew why I was the way that I was. But I couldn't really change it. And what made the biggest difference for me didn't happen until I was in my 40s. And at that point, I'd been studying metaphysics. So I was studying uh, science of mind, and I was also studying transformational technologies, which have a lot of metaphysical principles kind of woven in, particularly the landmark education or the Werner Earhart work. And basically, the biggest thing that really shifted everything and changed the game for me was this idea that we want to declare an unreasonable future and begin to live into that future, and in particular, the question, who would I need to be in order for that future to manifest and sustain itself? So I essentially went from kind of this endless process of trying to heal past trauma, which of course, you know, is worthy work and necessary work, but it's a different type of work than declaring you're going to transform your life and then to start grow, growing yourself deliberately in the direction of that dream and to kind of organize around who you imagine you would be in that future fulfilled. So that kind of catapulted my own development and how I was relating to myself and how I was relating to others and how I was relating to life. And basically I did that by declaring a future that I'd be engaged by my 42nd birthday, which was eight months out. It was kind of a crazy thing to say because I'd been looking for that person for two decades. But by shifting how I was working with myself and holding myself accountable to really stretching to to co-create that possibility with the universe as opposed to like praying it happens or hoping it happens to start to show up differently and to start to take risks in that direction. And it, it, it just began a cascade of miracles and transformations. And of course, those of you who read Calling in the One know that I did indeed get married to a wonderful man. And then I had my first baby when I was 43. And that's what inspired me really to write Calling in the One, which launched all of my career really as a teacher in the world yes and helped probably millions around the globe what do you think it is is it that we you said you step into that version that you need to become so is this about exchanging versions or is it almost like stepping into a different timeline well it's great you know when michelangelo was creating david he had this orientation to that big block of marble that David was already in there. And he just had to kind of chip away till he found David. When I mean, he talks about it, you know, when he spoke about it. So calling in the one is really kind of like that. So you're declaring a future that you've never had. And you have to use your imagination because you, you're asking yourself the question, well, who am I in this future? So you almost bring the, the future into the present. And you begin by trying to really imagine what it's like to be living that future. So you might say, what does it look like? What does it feel like? And then you might you know, feel someone with a loving touch on the small of your back. Or what does it smell like? It might smell like his freshly shampooed hair? Or what does it sound like? It might sound like him laughing in the next room on the telephone. Or, you know, you start to bring it into all of your senses. And then you ask yourself a series of three questions. And this, these questions were really originally based on Michael Beckworth's work, uh, his visioning practice. You ask, what would I have to give up in order to allow this future to come to me? Wow. Right. So that's a very deep question. And it's very different than why am I the way that I am? Yeah. Well, I'm the way that I am because my mother or because my father or my brother. You, you'll always get brother. answers to that question. So you, if you sit with that question, you, you, we all know, actually, you, you start to allow your intuitive knowing to take front and center in your consciousness. And you say, well, 
you know, maybe on a practical level, I could give up some of the clutter in my apartment oh, so wow. that there'd be room for another person to come Love into my that. home. Wow. Right. Or maybe I would give up smoking because smoking is kind of, you know, a mask that's keeping other people at bay and it's a form of self-hatred. And if I, and I don't want a relationship that's going to be based on, you know, a bit of hatred in the relationship. I want love. So how about I start with loving myself or you might get, you know, I have to give up my resentment towards my ex-boyfriend because, you know, I'm not looking at my part. I'm just blaming him, which means I'm not growing and I'm not really able to trust myself moving forward because I haven't really seen my part clearly in how I gave my power away and how I overgave to try and prove my value or, you know, I was giving as an audition to be chosen for wife and it wasn't genuine. Like all the ways that we kind of know that we're out of integrity, you really are confronted with all of that when you ask that simple question. So here we are, we're in meditation. We're trying on what it feels like to have love in our lives. The experience of of being chosen by the one you would choose. And then the next question you ask is, what would I need to let go? Or what would I need to begin to embrace? How can I grow to become the person I would need to be in order for this to go well? And that's also another, you know, it unleashes a whole other spectrum of, of wisdom, which is, well, I'd need to get better at managing myself when I get triggered so that I don't blow relationship up uh, in order to create health in relationships. And that's, 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 that's a big thing. Me. A lot of people just focus on getting to the relationship, but what, what happened when you were there? And who are you going to be when you are there? You can't yes. play the same old game and step into a new version. That change needs to be be applied on so many levels because it is a new version of yourself. And now you're really getting into how am I the source of my own experience, which is another really big Powerful. core tenet of calling it Own it. Work, own we, it. Well, most of us are victimized by the dating culture, by our ex-partners who we've labeled as, you know, narcissistic, love avoidant, codependent, whatever our labels are. But we're kind of prone towards blaming others or we're going to blame our parents or our circumstances or our culture. But we all have reasons for why this isn't going well. But in Calling in the One, there's an orientation or kind of a commitment right from the get-go to really look and see how I am the source of my experience. So inside of that, you know, how would I need to grow? Well, I need to become better at managing myself when I get triggered so I don't go right into threatening the relationship. Well, I'm going to leave if you don't do that. Because when you see yourself as the source, you get that if you act out of that kind of younger, impulsive, reactive part of you, you will destabilize all your relationships. So true. You'll bring out the worst in other people. Yes. So you can label them all you want, but you have to get your part in that in order to trust yourself that it's going to go differently this time. So we're looking at how you're relating to yourself, how you're relating to others, Maybe you're overgiving to all the time because you're more comfortable in the giver position, which is the power position. Or maybe you disappear yourself and put all of your focus on the other person. You don't show your feelings. You don't show your needs because you're you're overgiving to prove your value or you're, you're creating what we call pseudo safety. So there's all sorts of ways that we need to grow ourselves healthier in order to have healthy, happy love on the other side of this. The last question in that process is to ask yourself, what is my next step? And again, you're really just listening. You're in the stillness. If you ask the universe that question, you will get answers. You're going to get an answer like, why don't you clean out your drawers today and make space for another person to put their things Or you're going to get an answer that says, why don't you call your sister and just get off it with her and try seeing what happened from her perspective and apologize for your part. Or you're going to say, what's my next step is I'm going to take, you know, all of the gifts that my former partner gave me. 
I'm going to put them away in a nice box. I'm going to put them in the garage in a storage area so that my space is clean from that relationship. So, right, so there's this proactive, I am the co-creator of that future fulfilled. So it's not just insight or understanding into why I am the way that I am. It's who will I need to become? How do I actively grow myself in that direction? And what can I do today to, to co-create the manifestation of that miracle? Yeah, a friend called me today and I do love coaching myself. But for friends, I'm just a friend. I'm not a coach. I don't see, I don't think it's a healthy thing to do. And she's 42. She had really short and not very good relationships. And she called me and she was in a state of despair. And I think that when people are in such a deep state of despair, they can listen to what you're saying, but there is almost like a wall because they are so deep in the suffering it's hard for them to move themselves to go in meditation and clear the drawer and listening and take ownership because not to judge that they are in so deep in the depression and in the victimhood they they cannot see the light. I tried everything and it doesn't work. And obviously a female that is 42 and is longing for a relationship, it's a very difficult place to be. She feels very alone and there is a lot of suffering that is related to that. How would you coach her to get out of that state so she can take all the beautiful, incredible steps that you were talking about? I think when people are in a state where they're very emotionally centered in the victimized perspective, it's important that we obviously, as coaches, validate that experience because it is very painful, and she's, which I hear you did. I'm just saying just to for the other coaches in the audience too, right? Not me. I'm, I'm so. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you were tender when you said that. So I know you were very empathetic and caring about her because it is so painful. It's actually why I wrote Calling in the One. I know. I never started out to be. Uh, I always knew that I would write a book. I thought I was going to write a spiritual book. I never started out to be a relationship expert. And I only became a relationship expert because... I knew the suffering so much that your friend is in that once I figured out how to actually transcend it and create life outside of that story that I wanted to share it with others. Then I thought I would just do that and then I'd go on and write my real book. So it's funny because I held it like that for years until I finally recognized after you know thousands of copies sold that oh maybe this is actually the work I'm supposed to be doing. But um but for your friend the first question I might ask her is, can you articulate what you're assuming is true about yourself and about your relationships with others? And see if she can name it as an I'm alone and no one will ever be there for me. Oh, so painful just to hear that. It's so painful. It's very painful because that's the haunting splinter in her soul that she's kind of centered in and running from and trying to make wrong. And no matter what she does, you know, it comes back to that story. That's like the default story. So one of the things we want to do when we find ourselves in this place is to see if we can take a deep breath and send love to the part of ourselves that's suffering with that, the weight of that story. And not just what happened to us when we were four or seven, it's been happening over and over and over. And we don't really see how we are the source of it. It really does feel like something is just sitting on our stars. Mm. So then what I might say to her is how old is the part of you that first recognized that you would always be alone in this way? Oh, come on. that makes me sad. I mean, but it's beautiful, but it's just like, it's so deep. It's very, very deep. And she's going to say, as long as I remember, or she's going to say, when I was five and my father left or my mother sunk into a depression for two years, you know, where, where it's either like a developmental trauma or it's, a, or it's an acute trauma, but there was relational trauma that lodged in her as a self-sense and as her fate for the rest of her life. She's doomed to live this story. And what I do in Calling in the One is we help people to wake up to the deeper truth of who we are on the deepest level of our being, and we distinguish between the true self and the traumatized self. 
because the traumatized self, you know, it's a belief that we hold in our body. Beliefs are not in our brain. They're not thoughts. I know a lot of people say, change your thoughts, change your life. But I think that's really how that lives for us is it's in our body. It's an energetic field. If you walk into a room, let's say you walk into a party, you can kind of glance around the party and you can almost tell the people who live in a friendly universe versus the people who don't, right? It's like an energy that people wear. I'm not safe here. I need to protect myself. Or, you know, I'm lovable. I can't wait. Everybody wants to hear what I have to say. Tell me who you are. I'll tell you who I am. There's like energetically, we are anchored and centered in our stories in a way that's almost like our own personal, my friend calls it, Paul Young Eisentrath calls it a snow globe, our own snow globe. So I like to go in and identify what exactly is the story of the traumatized self? How old is that self? Where is he or she in your body? And then I like to also wake that person up to a larger perspective. So there's a part of all of us that's kind of outside that story. It might even be the part of her that knows that something different is supposed to be happening here. That's why she's so upset. Because she intuitively knows she didn't come here to be alone, and yet it keeps happening like that. So I'm interested in the part of her know that knows that something is not kosher here. That I am born for love. I am meant for love. It is my destiny to find love. And that's the part I want to articulate. And that's the part I want to then bring into relationship with that younger self and say, sweetheart, I'm so sorry you had that trauma, but let me tell you the deeper truth. You were not born to be alone. You came here to love and be loved, and you have the power to learn how to cultivate rich, loving relationships. It is your destiny to find great love in this lifetime. Because that's what we're going to call your power center, the true self. And that's the self that can actually find your way to that future. So those of us who are stuck in non-possibility, it's generally because we are confused and we are overly identified with the traumatized self that we created when we were too young to know any better. That's amazing. Why do you locate it in her body? What's the meaning of finding that uh, younger traumatized self in the body and how do you release it from the body? Yeah, it's more getting related to it and getting deeper, wider. Okay. Right. So, I mean, all because these beliefs are actually conclusions we came to in response to trauma, relational trauma. Trauma does lodge in the body. You can do a lot of all the trauma studies that are coming out now with Vessel van der Kolt, The Body Keeps the Score, really shows the, the science behind all of that. You can feel it. I've, unless somebody is dissociated from their body, which does happen because people have trauma in their body, sexual trauma and stuff, and then you have to try and help them to just be more somatically oriented. Most people who don't have that kind of dissociative problem that, that they're overcoming or challenged to overcome could go very quickly. It's right in my heart. I feel the heaviness in my heart, or I feel like a sickness in my belly, or I feel this tension in the back of my shoulders, or or my whole neck is closing up right now. And that's where trauma lives. Part of the reason why affirmations can be limited is that affirmations tend to be kind of things that we decide with our minds that we're going to say. But Wherever we're centered is where we're generating our stories from, our lives from. So we're going to be showing up inside of that. If you're gripped by an I am alone, you will do all sorts of things that are generative of that story outside of conscious awareness. So part of what we need to do once you recognize that self and you name that self is to start to look at how have I been the source of my own aloneness. So for me, because I I had aloneness as a pattern, one of my patterns was with unavailable men. So always married men somehow find their way. Available, single men, almost didn't recognize me. Any room I walked into, I was a magnet for the married men. It looked like it was just happening to me. I didn't know anything that I was doing in particular. I do think that there's a way that life runs in patterns. And until you interrupt the pattern consciously, 
it will continue to default that way. And a lot of what we need to learn is how to interrupt the pattern and becoming conscious of it in that direction. So one of the things that I did that was the source of my own aloneness is that because nobody had ever really been there for me as a child, I had no healthy expectation going into relationship that that should even be a criteria for me. That's amazing. Yeah. It was just off my radar. Here I am. I have a master's degree. I'm studying to become a psychotherapist. I've had run a nonprofit organization for five years that a thousand people participated in. So, you know, very accomplished person. I think we're all idiot savants in some way when it comes to these core wounds, just not even in my brain that one of the top criteria should be, is he available to love me? Will he be there for me when I need him? Wow. So I'm more caught by, is he charismatic? Do we have chemistry? You know, what is he up to in life? Oh, that's compatible. Just wasn't even on my radar. Do you feel like you're a, you're a psychic I, I think that when any of us who really tune into other people and hone that craft become more and more that way, yes. I don't know. Some of the things you said were resonating on so many levels, especially with that friend. I'm like, how, how does she how does she know? <laughs> this is amazing. Um, <laughs> well, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book now called True You Awakening, and it's the core work that we're doing in our community that's kind of the secret sauce to calling in the one and conscious uncoupling. And it's all about the traumatized self versus the true self and being able to access the true self. And the truth is there's about 21 core beliefs that have very predictable patterns. Oh my God. And they're all that predictable. So they're all that. That's what I'm making available to people now. Well, I can't wait to get it and read okay. it. I'll have to come back. I'll have to come back when the book yes, comes please, out. Yes, please, please, please. You, you come back tomorrow, anytime. You know, like, this is fascinating. <laughs> Let's move to your, your second book. Yes. After I had thousands of students and was married for a decade to try and announce to the world what I was getting divorced was quite traumatic. And it was not something that I saw coming early on. It was not something that I saw early on in our relationship. And I think that most of us who get married do not ever anticipate that that could possibly happen to us. And it did happen to me. And fortunately... Mark and I did it really beautifully and elegantly. It's never going to be easy to separate from someone you love. But if a separation is necessary, there is a way to do it that is kind, that is non-reactive, that is generative of a healthy relationship on the other side of this. Especially if you have kids. If you have kids in particular that you can co-parent well. And that the kids are, don't become emotionally homeless, that they actually are still part of a family that's just changing its form. That's a very strong phrase, emotionally homeless. I've never heard that before. That's what happens to children very often in divorce. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Even adult wow. children. Yeah. Even adult children. Wow. Because, you know, people, they do this whole bird nesting thing, which I, you know, I, I admire people who are willing to sacrifice like that for their children. And for those who don't know, bird nesting is when the parents keep the children in the main family home and then the parents rotate one week in and one week out so that the children don't have to leave their home, and nor are they going from schlepping from house to house. And sometimes people share one apartment. Sometimes they get two separate places to live. However, I like it, but the house is not the home. The relationship, the dynamics in the family is the home. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're going to bird nest, you still have to work this out as an adult with your former partner and so that you're doing the work so that the children don't get the eye rolling or the crossed arms or the icy stare or whatever it is it you know indicates the incompletion because even that will put children in the middle they have to give their loyalty to one parent over the other so when children are going back and forth from one home to the other if the parents have not recreated are happy even after family post-divorce 
the children are always on some level a little emotionally homeless because they're with dad, but they're missing mom or they're with mom and they're missing dad. So we don't want to do that to our kids. We want it more like, you know, in the old days when you'd get a cluster of aunts and cousins and grandmothers and stuff all living on one block, right? Everybody lived in the neighborhood. And you could just go to your aunt's house or you spend the night at your cousin's house. You go down the street to grandma's and you're still one family. You're not all living together, but you're still one family. So that's the ideal for children. So that's a lot of processing work to do that most people are ill-equipped to do. Everybody would aspire to an amicable divorce, particularly if you have children. But most of us are ill-equipped to manage the big emotions that come up and all of the flooding of hormones even that happens at the end of love in our brains and our bodies. We are programmed to go to war when we end a relationship just biologically. So that's the soulmate to soul hate phenomenon where you start hating the person you once loved. I think it's a trick of nature to keep us bonded because hatred is just as strong. A bond is love. I had a friend coming over today and she told me that she took six years to divorce her husband. Her husband cheated on her and did a lot of things like that because of the children. She said, I didn't want to traumatize my children it took six years to to make the divorce as calm as possible, and we're still good friends. Does it have to take that long? Well, well, she definitely took the slow and steady route. I mean, I don't think that's going to be possible for most people. It's really admirable. She was so committed. You know, everybody's going to have their own story. Sometimes people don't have a choice. The other person has, says they're leaving. And that's it. You know, there's a difference between somebody who's being left and someone who's leaving. Because the person who's being left is generally quite traumatized. The person who's leaving has had a long time to think about this and to build a life outside the relationship, to build an identity outside the relationship. That's so unfair. It occurs as very unfair to the person who's being left because then the person who leaves very often, they've already done their grieving work and by the time they go, they're kind of finished. It looks like they're finished. And they go on and start dating immediately. And it's that, that adds to the devastation of someone who's left. So, you know, look, all of us would aspire to, you know, live consistent with our own value systems the majority of the time. And I think that breakups are the hardest time to do that. They're really a litmus test for character because even the nicest of us, the most ethical of us, we will have an impulse to hurt the person who's hurting us. We will have an impulse towards getting back at that person. We're hardwired for fairness. If it doesn't seem fair, we want restitution. We can get very stuck on resentment and going over every little detail about what they did that they shouldn't have done or what they didn't do that they should have done. You know, it's easy to get stuck. And in particular, to interpret the breakup as evidence for the false traumatized story, that self. See, I will always be alone again. So prolonged grief is different than a normal course of grieving. So a normal course of grieving is always going to be present when you're losing a, an important relationship. You're going to go through all of those stages to some degree, but it will resolve itself and get to acceptance within just a few months' time. If you're suffering for longer than that, which many do in the aftermath of a really important relationship, it's likely because you came to conclusions that are re-wounding in some way, that kind of go back to validate that old story and conscious uncoupling i call it your source fracture wound the original break in your heart yeah i did a brain scan with dr amen a long time ago and my brain runs really hot and he talks about diamond patterns where you just you go on a loop with some thoughts and you loop again and again and again so what can one do to break those loops and you said two months are the it's a good enough time for you to start with your healing journey and 
people that get stuck with it and some people get stuck with it till the rest of their lives. They never change the pattern. Well, they do. They do. That's the danger. I always say breakups are a crossroads and many go on to live a lesser life in the aftermath of having their heart broken. Step three. So conscious uncoupling is five steps and the first three are all dealing with ourselves. We're not even dealing with the other person. I know Gwyneth Pal Paltrow kind of kicked it into the lexicon and made it look like it's just how the two of you are working together. But there's a lot of work for most of us to do to even get to the place where we could be fair minded and generous and, you know, keep the peace and build the new life together with goodwill and all of that. The first step is, of course, dealing with our overwhelming emotions because we have to start where we are. I call it find emotional freedom, which is we are anything but emotionally free. It's looking at how we can actually transform those negative emotions into the fuel that we need for positive change. So for example, if you feel rage, what's good about that is that if you feel rage, it's, it's likely because you need to step up and reclaim the right to be treated with respect. Right, so rage is a, or a normal reaction to having your rights violated, to be treated with dignity, to be told the truth, you know, all of those things. So, so you want to transform that into an intention that you set to graduate from this pattern. Never again will this happen, right? And then step two is reclaim your power and your life, which is all about how can I see myself as the source when I am so wronged? by someone. Someone did cheat. Someone did lie. Someone did steal. So we get very captivated by that. So I tell people, even if it's 97%, the other person's fault, you want to be really interested in your 3%. And very often it's subtle. I ignored my intuitive knowing. I minimized the red flags. I didn't ask the right questions. How was I lying to myself if someone was lying to me? So you really have to know that because otherwise you're never going to really trust yourself to go into a situation again where you could be hurt all over again unless you graduate from that 3% pattern. So step three is where we get to making empowered meaning of the breakup. So it might be getting in relationship to the younger self. You know, sweetheart, how old are you? What's the meaning I'm making? I'm invisible or I'm not worthy or I'm always going to be alone. So you have to name that. How old are you? And then you want to learn how to mentor that part of you to more true meaning. And eventually where you need to get to is even when someone I love is not loving me or is incapable or unwilling to love me, I am still a lovable person. Even when someone is being disrespectful, I am still a person who is worthy of respect. Just because someone is shaming me and blaming me does not mean that I've actually done anything wrong. Right? So you actually have to claim the deeper truth and stand there. And then there's this piece in step three where I help people to be responsible for how they may have been showing up in the relationship that was kind of a leftover way of relating from that source fracture wound that literally kind of enrolled their partner into playing that out with them. That's what we're stuck with is our own like, oh my gosh, I acted that way. I did that. Now he thinks this of me. In step three, very often people don't want to be connected to that person or they're not, it's not safe to be connected to that person. So we do what's called a soul-to-soul -soul meditation, where you call that person into your meditation, and you stand in the deeper truth of who you are, and you correct their perception of you in your mind. That's amazing. Wow, that's so powerful. Yeah, yeah it's, very, it's very powerful to shift it that way. And it liberates people from, from prolonged grief. Because I think prolonged grief is getting stuck in an old story about yourself. Yes, because everyone are our reflection. They are mirrors to what we project. So when you show that person, this is the truth of who I am, it's almost like a, a domino chain of so many healings, of so many times where you projected yourself in that way in different relationships. Maybe not even love relationships. It's very healing. It's 
Incredible. Yes. This gets into the metaphysical uh, quantum physics land of non-locality, which quantum physics does really show quite a bit of evidence for. And when you've been connected with someone uh, at that level as lovers, you know, that connection doesn't really end just because you've given the keys to the condo back. The connection is alive. And if that person has a story about you, that you're bad, that you're wrong, that you're less than, that you're not worth worth it, you know, whatever their story is, you'll feel it in the field. And it will be like there's a curse on your life in some way. So it's very powerful to go in and to say, I understand why you might think that of me, but I need to tell you who I actually am. And you imagine that person with respect in their eyes, that they get it. And then you make a request. I request that you hold me only in this light, that you speak well of me. So there's a lot that can actually shift. Now, the other person might be going to the soulmate to soul hate as an easy way out, you know, to try and separate more easily. And you can't control that, but you would have the upper hand in it if you saw it through that lens. How do you come up with this type of meditations that are so powerful? Do you get yourself in meditation and then the insight? Because it's very deep and it's very beautiful. It's very profound. And just like I'm just hearing like one profound thing after after another, after another. It's like what, what, what do you do to connect to source to get this information yourself? Do you feel like... It's coming from you or is it being channeled through you? Yeah, I'm I'm channeling it. Thank you. Thank you for that question. When I was 19, I don't know. I just always loved, I loved God, even though I wasn't raised in a home that talked about God. When I was even 14, I started reading religious text and I almost had to hide it from my parents. And then I went off to Bible school when I was 19. I, I joke and say I'm a Bible school dropout all the time because I didn't end up finishing. But I did spend uh, a long time in the chapel every single day asking God to use my life for good. I had a fantasy that that meant that I was going to go off and then start speaking to people or ministering to people. Of course, what ended up happening is my boyfriend married someone else. My best friend turned against me. My parents had wanted nothing to do with me and threw me threw me out of their home. Uh, I gained 50 pounds. I got isolated. I had an anxiety disorder. It just, my whole life went into the toilet. And so I thought that God had abandoned me. But what ended up happening is I did kind of crawl myself out of the ditch after several years. It took about 12 years and 12-step programs and therapy and transformational seminars and all sorts of things. But when I was in my 30s, I had healed the eating disorder. I didn't really have it as an active problem anymore. And I said to, to life, how, how can I say thank you for saving my life? And I went down and I got this idea about going down to Skid Row. I was a singer-songwriter at the time. I had never done any healing work with anybody. But I went down to Skid Row and I started running creative writing workshops so that people could write songs with professional songwriters because I was in L.A. and there were so many professional songwriters there. And I was in this group week to week just making things up wanting to be a contribution to people. And people's lives, there were about 18 men and women in the group, and their lives were radically changing quickly and and, and radically, you know, rapidly and radically. And I was sitting in that group one day, and that's when it caught me like a, (gasps) and I realized that all of those years, that's beautiful. that actually was the answer to my prayer. I now knew how to transform from the inside out. I had almost a transmission about it. So all of my work is really co-created in that in that space of deep listening where I'm bringing it forward. Have you heard of uh, Theo? Mm-mm. Have you heard of Abraham Hicks? Sure. So Astor Hicks went to a seminar by Theo. Uh, Theo is chan- being channeled by uh, Sheila Gillette. And she was asking the same question where... She had some kind of trauma she needed to survive. I forgot the story completely. And she said, God, like, use me. I'll be the tool. Just use me. And then she started channeling Theo. And they were a guest on the show. And we know them personally. They're amazing. 
maybe this is a very key question for people to allow source to flow through them uh, in order to manifest their destiny. Absolutely. I, I love that you're even mentioning that. That's beautiful. It really begins with making ourselves available to be used by the light. Yes. So, so beautiful. And everything, all the techniques that you mentioned, they can be translated to, in, in your first book, in your second book, they can be translated to so many other things in our lives all of them, it all stems from the same core wounds, all our problems, all our, I guess, negative manifestations, they all stem from that like core wound or from not owning our life and our relationships, from not owning our dreams or believing in our dreams. That's the book I'm working on right now. <laughs> that it's, is it's, so. But I do have people do calling in the one with other things that they're committed to manifesting. And uh, I actually, it used to be used uh, in a church, a science of mind church, to train all their practitioners. They required them to go through the calling in the one process because it's about really calling in yourself, your highest and your best self, and manifesting your life from there. So beautiful. And, and another thing that is beautiful that I want to mention that we spoke about prior to the interview is that when people go through your unconscious, conscious uncoupling, uh, when they go through that process, it's not that they go through it just so they can break up properly. A lot of time when people go through that process, you told me, they actually come together because they are, they, they've done some healing work that will allow them to stay with the love of their life and not break their relationship. Yeah. Well, so why I can promise people that they're going to have greater love on the other side of conscious uncoupling is because the conscious uncoupling process actually teaches people some core skills. If they had had those skills in their relationship, might have prevented a breakup. But I've had a lot of people read conscious uncoupling after and say, gosh, I wish I'd read this when I was still married because we wow. never would have broken up. So we do make room for couples to do it. And we do say, look, whether you're in the midst of a breakup, you're anticipating a possible breakup or considering a possible breakup, you, you can do the, the course anyway because it's going to help you to, to end the old dynamics between you and to grow the relationship healthier. You can re, rebirth the relationship. And then some people come in and take it. They, they haven't recovered even after a long time, three years, five years, ten years. They're still suffering with really trusting love, not dating anyone, or just you know festering resentments difficulties with the next partner that they're co-raising children with. So they'll come in and do it to help them then too. That's beautiful. I want to be respectful of your time. So before we say goodbye for now, I have two questions for you. One is what are your three top tips to living a stellar life? And two is where can people find you? Oh, thank you. Well, I think you kind of made visible um, maybe my definition of a stellar life is to have your life be used in something, in service to something greater than yourself. So asking life, what can I do for you? How can I be of service? How can I use my gifts to bless other people? I think two is, you know, there's a way that we were, I am a psychotherapist, so I'm pretty well researched here. But there's a way that we're doing a lot of our healing work, our personal development work, by only just going back into the past. But I think that, that healing and transformation are two different domains. And I think it's very important to take a stand for an unreasonable, unpredictable future, a future that is not going to happen unless you actually stand for it and begin moving yourself in the direction of your dreams and being developmental in nature, not just analytical but also developing the things that somehow you didn't learn when you were young. And three, stellar life. I think it's very important to develop an awareness, a very deep awareness of where we're centered in any given moment at the level of beliefs. 
and the I am or the I am not or others are, and to become conscious of that and to always course correct, not by, again, trying to understand why we feel that way, but to wake ourselves up from the trance by reminding ourselves who we actually are and what it is that we're here to contribute and to create and to live life from that center. Awakening yourself from the trance, because this world is uh, very much an illusion and a dream that we are creating every day and every moment. So I really resonate with that. Catherine, where can people find you and get all those amazing books? Yeah, yeah. So obviously, CatherineWoodwardThomas.com. I do have an upcoming Conscious Uncoupling course this summer, so you can find out about that at ConsciousUncoupling.com. And... Um, you know, we're pretty accessible. We have a lot of free offerings on our site. We love to just help people to evolve their capacity to love and be loved. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This was wonderful. Thank you for having me. And thank you, listener. Remember to be in service for something greater than you are. Take a stand for an unreasonable future. Develop deep awareness of your beliefs and wake yourself up from this dream and have a stellar life. This is Orion. Till next time.